begin by introducing you to the characters of our story. We have the PI, the grad student, the postdoc, the lab manager, and of course the mantis shrimp. Also known as stomatopods, these marine crustaceans live in temperate and tropical waters around the globe and range in size from 1 centimeter to 30 centimeters. Some live in muddy or sandy burrows, while others hide in crevices in the intertidal zone. From the Great Barrier Reef in Australia to the kelp forests of California, the paddock lab has spent countless hours in the fields collecting and observing these animals. Our lab is in the midst of a comparative study on the evolution of mantis shrimp. The goal is to collect as many species as possible in order to do tests on the morphology, force, and mechanics of the raptorial appendage. Half the adventure of this type of fieldwork is getting there. On an average day on the Great Barrier Reef, we begin by loading up the boat, then don our diving gear and various collecting tools, and descend into the blue. Because many stomatopods live in chunks of dead coral, we search for fields of perfect coral rubble. The goal is to collect rubble that contains enough cavities to have stomatopods, but isn't too porous. We fill our mesh dive bags with the rubble and use a lift bag to bring this heavy cargo to the surface, where we later inspect every piece for stomatopods. Sometimes these fields of coral rubble are found in much shallower water and don't require scuba diving. A tourist would probably see a white sandy beach like this as a prime vacation spot, but our research team sees this as a prime stomatopod habitat. There we are, combing the intertidal zone for stomatopods. All of these nooks and crannies provide an excellent place for both stomatopods and their prey to hide. In this type of environment, you can't catch a stomatopod without a bit of a chase. They are fast swimmers and dart under rocks, eluding even the most discerning eye of a stomatopod hunter. So, sometimes we resort to brute force. Many stomatopods live in holes in the sand, and each species requires a different collection technique. Sometimes, when you find the right kind of burrow, you just have to poke and prod the hole until the animal comes out though often we come up empty-handed. In the shallow sand flats, we use a yabby pump, a vacuum-like tool that sucks the animal, along with its entire burrow, out of the sand. These small sand dwellers are usually easy to catch, as long as you know which type of burrow to look for. Other more elusive sand dwellers live along the edges of mangroves where there is ample prey to satisfy their voracious appetites. These large spearing stomatopods are hardly visible except for their eyeballs which protrude from the sand. Can you see it? There it is. Catching these animals requires a careful noosing technique. First, we clear the mucus cap off the burrow's opening. Then we place the noose and place the bait, and then we wait. Eventually the stomatopod grabs for the bait, and we are able to pull it out. Now we move to the cool murky waters of California, where we search the muddy bottom for a large, aggressive stomatopod species. We search for burrows that are either closed or open. This species is more curious than others, so the chase is quite interactive and a lot of fun. We try to lure them out of their burrows with pieces of squid bait and then grab them with a net, but sometimes they escape us.
When we go to the fields, we don't just collect our research specimens. We educate whoever we can about our research project. We also collect field observations through audio and video recordings. Here we deploy a miniature camera at the edge of the mangroves to observe the large spearers during their nighttime foraging behavior. In California, we deploy hydrophones and cameras to listen to communication between mantis shrimp and observe their comings and goings throughout the day. At the end of the day, the life of a stomatopod hunter, it is a good life.